I want to welcome Ian Pundit. What, what do we got? Radio show host, professor, deacon, author. Any other titles that I'm missing in there? <laughs> crime fighter. Uh, uh, I prefer crime fighter. Do you have? Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Can yeah. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, I I'm used to getting no response to my jokes, so that's why <laughs> when I said that, but better double check. Um, so I, I got some listener questions, so I want to go to them first because they were better than mine. Is that, is that so? Just so you know. Yeah. And the first, the first one was. Uh, let's get it up, and I don't want to try to butcher it. I have no, I have no secret. <laughs> well, these are pretty good. Ask me uh, what was your experience like uh, writing child's books? What motivated you to do it, oh. and how was it challenging versus other types of books? Uh, you know, that's a thing about being a writer. Sometimes you don't really get much of a choice. It just has to come out. And so I had written this poem for our first dog, uh, who we were we were referring to as Dizzy the Mutt with a propeller butt. And uh, it, it was based on a true story. I was this little escape artist dog that we got from the pound. That no matter what we seem to do, we used to look out the window and there he was again out in the street wandering around. So um, I wrote this, just a little poem to make the kids laugh. And then the latter one, um, I've, I've only written two, but I've, I've got a third that I've kind of knocked out about marriage. But um, the uh, the second one was about uh, our next dog, which was uh, Jackula, the vampire dog. And that was written because Jackula was so afraid of thunder and lightning that I decided to write <laughs> A story in which he's the hero uh, during a thunder and lightning storm, which made him a, a vampire dog, and uh, that he wasn't uh, he wasn't uh, the fray cat that he was because he really was. It was terrible. It was just the most insecure little shivering thing. <laughs> so I, I wrote, and, and I kind of wanted to write one where the girl was the heroine, just to test my voice. So I wrote uh, Jackula, the vampire dog. And we did them for dog charities, which was really key. We we published them in conjunction with a small press, and we donated all of the proceeds to uh, uh, to a dog charity, which is good. I, I find it fascinating because I, I haven't been able to write a book yet, and you're knocking out all kinds uh, of books. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, now I'm working on this podcast, which is sapping all of my book energy. But I'll get back to it. I was, I was going to ask you about the podcast. You've got a new one out. Uh, so go ahead and tell my listeners about it because they probably are interested in it if they haven't already. Well, I hope, I hope so. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, – I've been cooking it up for a while because people kept asking me, well, when are you going to do your podcast? And, uh, <laughs> and I wasn't interested in doing one because I thought, well, I'm, I'm doing Coast to Coast AM live two or three times a month that was plenty, you know, I didn't feel the need to, to do anything more when it came to radio, but I was interested in doing a fictional podcast. So that's the part that intrigued me. And it took me a long time to find somebody that was willing to let me do it. And I had brought it up to iHeart a couple of times because they own the rights to uh, coast to coast. Obviously they were the distributor. And I, I thought, well, okay, they'll, they'll jump at this chance. And um, and then it took about uh, two, about two years, I think. I mean, every once in a while, I'd mention it again, and then sometime last spring, they they came to me and said, "Hey, we got an idea." <laughs> uh, and I said, "Well, I'll only do it if I can do a fictional podcast." And they were like, oh, "Well, send us what you got." So I did, and it worked out. And now, I think I just got the chartable for yesterday. Uh, so here we are in August. It's been up, and it, in a, in the U.S., it averages somewhere in the around fifty, about number fifty in the uh, drama category. And then in Canada, it's been ranked pretty high, and around the around the world, it, it's getting a, a better SEO report. So we were number some, we were pretty high up in Norway for a while, but but you never know about. <laughs> podcast it might just be one person listening in norway whatever well that's true i'm always surprised because i have a bunch of canadian listeners too so i i don't they're on board with podcasts so 
that right. kind of blows my mind. <laughs> Well, you know, and I had this love-hate relationship with Canada. I happen to think Canada seems like a really cool place, but I do plan on and on in pushing them to the front of the uh, line when it comes to the uh, space aliens eating us. I want them to eat the Canadians first. Some of them don't take that in the spirit in which it's intended, but I think, you know, you want to brag about your health care? Fine. You want to brag about how you're in better shape? Great. You're the appetizer, you know. I, don't, <laughs> I have the un, I have the unju- and unsensitive joke of the moment. They're already smoked too. Oh well, there you go. It's true. <laughs> Get a nice smoky flavor. And there went all my Canadian listeners that I did have. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. They, you know, the funny thing about Canadians, they have this great. They do have a great sense of humor, and it's very dry. And then, uh, so I think they they, they find it. Okay. Um, so since you mentioned coast to coast, I have a, a dumb question for you. Sure. What's the difference between a ghost and a spirit? Well, it's not a dumb question. And it, it's interesting. It's confused by the language. Even the biblical language refers to the Holy Ghost. And then other people refer to it as a, a spirit. Um, so in a certainly in a religious sense, a spirit is that thing which connects us to uh, the divine, right? But a ghost in our parlance is more commonly thought of as being a sort of a lost soul. So it's being something that which is earthbound as opposed to divine. Yeah, there you go. I've been I've been wondering that for a while, and I figured somebody yeah. out there has a, has a reasonable and, reasonable answer besides uh, they're different. But, and that's a reasonable answer. It's not the definitive answer, but it's informative. I think. Yeah, well, it's better than nothing. How long have yeah. you been doing coast to coast now? It's been quite a while. Yeah, it sure has. Since I think I think we're coming up on our twenty third or fourth year. I'd have to check, but. I did it once, and then I started doing it regularly by 1999. It depends on how we mark it. Um, and I can't remember if the first time I did it was within was the early part of 1999, or was it the tail end of 98? I, I can't remember. But anyway, it, it's that plus um, 1999, whatever we whatever that puts us. Almost almost 24 years. Yeah, I was gonna say we'll call it 24. With some, there's some time off in the middle. I, I took, I, I left twice once to finish seminary and once because I had taken over a morning show and I didn't think I could do both at the same time. And then I think I left a third time because of the tinnitus. And then I came back again. So you're the bad penny. You just keep showing up. <laughs> they keep having me back. I don't know. How you think they'd learn. Well, someday. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's get back to that. Why is it important for religious people to ha- be able to express their anger in the context of their spiritual life? And there's a follow-up part to this. And what does a healthy expression of anger towards even God look like? Yeah, well, it looks like Jesus on the cross. That, plain and simple. You know, I mean, that he quoted... The first line that Jesus um, speaks from during the crucifixion, the first line that we see that is written even in the English translations is Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? And this is the first line from Psalm 22, not Psalm 23, not the one that you see people you know, reading at funerals and whatever, which is kind of a reconciliation or a reconfirmation of one's uh, commitment, one's submission. I, I will, you lead, I will follow. Um, but anger psalms are, are more often written and anger, angry prayers by extension. In times of turmoil, when it's very confusing to the faithful exactly whose side God is on. And I think it's healthy because if we believe in, in an all-knowing, all-seeing God, who are we fooling? Right? I mean, we, we are, you already, if it's true that the divine 
can hear the 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 echo of our of our deepest thoughts well then we best be able to express them and to be able to share them in a in a way that helps to rebuild the relationship and that's really what angry prayer is about it's about a healthy expression within a relationship and you know couples spat and parents with kids spat and friends disagree on things um so why would we not think that if a divine is real uh, we would expect that there would be some sort of disagreement at some point and i think this is what we learn from the bible is that the there are all, there are about five different categories of psalms and the largest of those five categories are angry psalms um, we tend to edit them out of our services because they're not helpful to some people to be in a service, you know, and, and to read a psalm, which is really angry. But personally speaking, they're there for a reason. And they're there to help to circle back, to give us a voice, to give our, our words some guidance when it comes to what we have to say. And I think people should be very liberated when it comes to it times of conflict and trial to be able to say everything they want to say apparently you've left so there you go i that's probably my record <laughs> no i'm, I'm back. my hosts into just kind of leaving the mic open and going out to their car and driving home <laughs> well my computer decided to say to plug me in now so okay <laughs> uh, what a morning right <laughs> yeah uh so so we're good there, which is important. Uh, so, the five, okay, so anger, what are the other five types of psalms? Well, before I forget. Well, well there's, I mean, there's the, there's the praise psalms. Those are the ones that we hear most often. Then there's the royal psalms. Oh, God, you're such a great king. Oh, God, you know, your, your kingliness gets me through the day there's all of that so i mean there's and then smaller categories on top of that but mostly those are the big three okay and i got this other listener question and then okay well as an episcopalian i said that right i'm surprised because I, I was worried i was going to say something else <laughs> well yeah, as an episcopalian but yeah. yes yeah. well <laughs> or, or with or whiskey pillions, which is what a lot of them are. Yes. Uh, given his experience through in, in and through the ministry, what is his thoughts on John Shelby Strong's ideas of non fiestic yeah. Christianity? Yeah, so he was an interesting guy. There's a, there was this whole group of people during the 70s in particular, uh, but it's always been there and it'll always be. Um, you know, Spong had a, he had a lot to say about the origin of the texts, and a lot. There's a lot of challenges uh, from many of the different uh, faith traditions. There's kind of one in every. There's one vocal person in almost every tradition who says uh, that's that's not what the text means, or we should be more. Um, uh, we should go. Uh, we we should view faith in a different context, and I think that uh, that he's picked a good one. You, you don't have to agree with him; he's a pot stirrer, or he was anyway. I think passed many years ago. But there were there's there should be. I mean, that's really what reversing the table order is always in order. There's I no reason why we should be think that the the. We shouldn't be looking at faith as like a, um, advanced Sunday school, which is what a lot of people do. I was going to say, I always look forward to those pot stirrers who make you think about what you believe because right. so often we just kind of show up on Sunday and leave. Oh, and... Yeah. Well, especially men, you know, men um, tend to, have to bottom line everything. Where do I have to go? What do I got to do? Kneel here. Good. Okay, fine. Say these words. Good. Am I done? I'm done. Okay, thank yeah. you. You know, and they're not very process oriented by nature, or at least by culture in our Western culture. And so um, that they re they're more resistant to that 
Um, women tend to be much more process thinking, uh, more uh, more concerned about kind of how do we how are we going to get there, not where the there is. And um, I'm I'm I tend to be I tend to think like that. I tend to think I, I in the end I, I don't you know do I end up in heaven? I don't know. Be nice, I guess. <laughs> You know, well, your dogs age, are so. <laughs> yeah, my dog. Yeah, I, I, and I think good. My dog deserved it. Uh, but um, you know, I, I, if all I ever did was chew on somebody's slipper, then I deserved it too. But um, I, you know, I think that we're complicated beings, and and I just don't worry about that. You know, the, the last should be first. The first should be last. All I care about is am I am I doing something better today than I did yesterday. That's a good goal. That's what I've been trying to do lately. Just be yeah an inch an inch better today today than yesterday. Right. Yeah. That's all we're called to do. We don't know where the we don't know where it leads us. My uh, younger son is um, in the process of aspiring to be a Buddhist monk, and it makes him really happy. And all I want him to be is happy. So, you know, he's gonna he's gonna go back to a monastery again for a couple of months and he's going to serve and then he'll come back. He'll leave again. he will come back. And then from there he'll, he'll leave. And, you know, hopefully along the way, he'll find out whether that's the right place for him. I was going to say that has to be a fascinating process. I was listening to you leave and go back and leave and right. go back. But, right. I mean, never crossed my mind to even pursue it. Well, but, I mean, we, we, and we, this, again, this is part of this Western, timeline thinking that we have that we're always doing something and then we go to the next time i think is much more circular it's much more tied to harvests and so we're going to be back in this place again at some point so are we going to be better the next time we were here and i don't mean that in a reincarnation sense i mean this time next year i who knows where exactly but we'll be looking at another we look at seasons differently than we should look at time and i think that it's i look at my son's life as full of seasons and i look at my own life that way too and so i don't i don't i, I hope it's what he wants and that it, they want him and together they'll find a love connection and if it's not then then we know that you know that the divine had a different plan. Off to the next. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about the season that you are went through um, early, becoming interested in faith. Yeah. Um, because where did that was it? Teaching or faith first? Oh no, I was always. I mean, I, I I can never think of a time when I wasn't a child of faith, ever. And that's part of my problem when I was in seminary. Everybody had these great, like, uh, uh, you know, born again experiences, or they talk about like how wayward they were from their faith, and then they came back, and I was like, "Oh, well, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't do anything. I never. I wasn't a Satanist for three years or something. I didn't. You know, I wasn't a member of a jazz trio that crisscrossed the country, leaving." broken hearts and you know lines of cocaine behind me i've just i've always been a person that that held faith as being the the enhancement that helped me avoid problems not a force field didn't prevent problems from reaching to me but if i if i lived a faithful life then i narrowed the possibility that i would do something that would be harmful for somebody else or for me so no, I've always been a person of faith. Well, I'm gonna I've double always... into my question here. Yeah. When did that moment transition from sitting in the pew to sitting up front? <laughs> right, I was 11. Um, and uh, I honestly, this is the weirdest. I, I had a very distinct call memory when I was 11 years old. And it said, someday you'll be a pastor. And I thought, well, that's stupid because, A, I don't want to be one. And B, um, I didn't come from that tradition. I came from a very congregational model. So there was no, we didn't have a professional pastor. We didn't, there was no, there was nobody in my life. I, we weren't Catholic. We didn't have priests. We didn't have faith leaders in that sense. 
And so I thought, well, that's a call, but it's someone's, you know, it's the wrong call. It's, you know, the, somebody's misdialed, you know. And, uh, but yet it, it always stuck in the back of my head that, you know, if you have gifts, discernible gifts, and that's the question of discernment, if, if they're helpful for other people, well, you should use them. And I would make the same argument for somebody who is a singer, right? Singers sing, dancers dance, writers write. There's no, you 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 have to, you're obligated to. It's the right thing to do. So I um, I felt very strongly that I could see myself doing it. It just that I didn't really have another call experience for a long time. And then sometime in my twenties, I started thinking about chaplaincy. Because I was very interested in uh, interfaith uh, communication and, you know, sort of even multi-denominational gatherings. And, and I've been kicked out of enough churches. That I knew that that was the right thing for me. I was, I was, uh, I was, I was, uh, uh, I, I was uh, forbidden to return to young life in high school. <laughs> <laughs> the evangelical organization. I was dating a girl who was in Young Life, and I rather enjoyed it. Uh, they did not enjoy me as much, and uh, I asked too many questions, which th they stammered over. And uh, you know, they they had one way of understanding life, which was, you know, you 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 declare that yourself is born again, and and I started researching that concept of what does that meant to be born again. And I, and then when I came back to them with what I feel was pretty strongly the biblical understanding of that, they were like, no, 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 that's not what we do. It wasn't part of their business model, you know? And um, so I, that's when I started to really think about faith in a more serious way. And then sometime in my 30s, I was fired from WGN. Technically, my contract wasn't renewed, but same thing. And and that's when I started to really feel it again. I started to really feel this like, you know, I should do this. But it wasn't because I felt like I really didn't see myself like living, you know, in in a house next to the church with a little thatch roof or something like that. And I didn't want to raise PKs. It was not an interest <laughs> of mine. Um, I'd known too many, you know, PKs by that point who were, you know, I dated some PKs who at that point I noticed when it was, they were the first ones to say, Hey, let's go skinny daping, you know, <laughs> and nobody tell my dad, you know, as they ripped off their shirt and ran into the pool. And, um, and I just, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. Um, not that I hated that experience at the time, but I didn't want to raise children who lived in a kind of duality or a kind of hypocrisy, you know, or a kind of repression for that matter too. Um, so, yeah. So I think it was sometime that right around that time that I started taking it more seriously and I started looking at seminary and it was much more based on the idea of how can I help? I didn't have a model for what help looked like, but I think originally my goal was to become a um, uh, kind of a backup pastor, you know, was to work within a church, step in when somebody has an emergency, do hospital chaplaincy, that kind of work. And that's pretty much what I did. So radio, I heard radio in there early. So yeah, that, I, that, all I've ever that, done professionally. I was going to say, so that had to have been the first love, or? No, I'm just good at, I mean, I say that, like, I know. <laughs> oh, come I, on, you it, have to You have to love it at some point to, no, to do it all the time. No? It came, it came easily to me. And so it was fun. To, it was easy to love. You know, I mean, like, I. so I was a disc jockey. Well, I mean, what's there oh. not to love about that, right? I'd sit in a room, <laughs> play records, talk to girls on the phone, play clips back on the air of being I said it was out to Bobby that was fun <laughs> I loved that that was great so I worked as a, a jock uh, for ages and then I started doing morning radio and morning radio was a little bit more talk oriented 
And then after years of doing sort of talk gag oriented morning radio is when I transitioned into talk radio in a purer sense. But even there, I wasn't comfortable doing political talk. So to go back to your first question, I don't care about that. I'm not trying to convince people to believe the things I believe in. Mostly because I don't even, you know, I mean, I think I know what I believe in, but I could change, right? And I worked with some big, pretty big names in the business who were and still are um, in many ways just kind of big hypocrites because they didn't, they, they lived a public life because politically on the air, it brought in a lot of money. But privately, they're, they're like, yeah, wow. You know, <laughs> there's a there's a lot of money in this here. Try it like this. You know, you should be the next uh, Rush Limbaugh or something. And I was interested in that. But I was in, I did love to talk about conservative principles. I did like I mean, because I'm I'm kind of a I'm, I'm sort of boring in that way. And I, I do believe in um, not in conservative in the social sense, but. I believe government should be small and I think that people should be led properly by good leaders who are going to keep their eye on the, the commonwealth, that kind of a thing. That was an easy thing. But I don't believe in using politics to force opinions on other people. I don't believe in using media to force opinions. I believe in, in the, in, um, you know, sort of the, uh, uh, the exchange of, of new ideas. I'm all, I was, I've always been for gay marriage. I've always been for all these things, which would tweak some other people, but I, I don't see it as the government's role, you know, to get involved in it. So yeah, I don't want the government I mean, in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you can't say, Oh, I don't want, I, you know, we can't have the government get involved in our business. Well, except for that business. So then we think that's, I just, I don't get it. And so uh, I stay away from politics on the air. It's also no fun. I don't like to argue, you know, I, I mo mostly people who would call up talk radio shows, mostly I uh, couldn't argue their way out of a wet paper bag. And I just didn't, it just didn't feel fair. It wasn't a fair fight. And it, I'm kind of an old gunslinger in that sense that like, I just want to sit here. I, I want to sit my sarsaparilla and and play cards. You know, I don't. I wouldn't. I'm not interested in walking the streets and and doing. A, and but yet, if someone's going to draw on me and they have to, they feel the need to prove that they're the fastest gun in the West. They do it at their peril because it's not that I don't know what I believe. It is not that I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but it just most people can't really articulate articulate their own arguments they rely heavily on, on derivative arguments they pick up from the media and those are the easiest to pull apart yeah it's sad there's a lot a lot i can't even say a lot line. big enough at this point yeah. yeah um so you you came into coast about the time well when art was winding down right because he retired I, in 2003 he, finally no no he art had art didn't know that i mean art had I mean, that Art had been doing, Art Bell had been doing Coast to Coast for about six years, maybe. Um, by the time I came around, the show was an immediate hit. It was a rocket hit. Um, it had started as a local show with a, on a big stick, we call it, on a good, on a, on a big on a transmitter with a, with a long reaching signal. Then it went national. Um, and so I don't know exactly the timeline off the top of my head, but um our um there's all sorts of things that were that came up and art was just he would get he was kind of, he was a little mercurial so that's, there are times that's what I was wondering he, a little bit about his personality because I, oh yeah you see the image that i you know the smoky kind of right, mysterious right, right. which is image. true right that's that's what i kind of figured but i i you know i've never spoke to well never spoke to him in long enough no, no. now but he was also, at the same time, he was a, very much a radio guy. Art Bell was a host. He was an, a proponent of free thinking, he came, which came from his libertarian roots. But he was not somebody who suffered fools. 
And so, I mean, it's fun, especially to hear these old Art Bell tapes because people mythologize on Art Bell that, you know, that he was sitting around, mm, interesting. He didn't actually, a lot of times he just shut people down because he thought they were stupid. And it was funny. He would say, he'd be like, that, sir, that doesn't make any sense at all. Well, Art, let me click. And then he would go on to the next caller. And that's that's who Art was. And, and Art had that, he had the... Um, the bona fides to be able to do that. And he had on really interesting people that were particular to him. He would have, he would explore subjects, which he, he never did anything because he felt he had to, which I admire tons. Uh, and then he kind of got tired of it. And then he resigned for a while and then he came back and then he left again and then he came back and then he left again and then he came back. And maybe that's why Coast keeps you. Maybe that's what yeah, maybe <laughs> it's been a pattern. Um, art led the way for their patients. <laughs> I'm no, no art bell. It, it's interesting because obviously, you know, we're still in this this medium, right? And right. that seems to be the candle everybody wants to compare you to. But when right. his show was on in the nineties, there was no one else doing it. Like that was magic. That is so true. I mean, what I think even art didn't realize. Is that he, he and I, you know, he caught lightning in a bottle. He was the right guy at the right time and nobody was doing it. There had been others before him that had done it. There are, there are one or two radio late night hosts who would delve into these topics. Um, and they did it, you know, well, and art did it as well as they did or better. But he, when when the nibbling started, right? You know, the TV came along and said, oh, we'll take this part. Or another radio show came along and said, oh, we'll take that part. And when they just, he was like, at some point, Coast to Coast became kind of like, um, it, it kind of, it kind of was like, like it was, it was like a shark attack. It was like a, uh, it's shark week. So I'm thinking about this, but it's sort of like, um, um, it's sort of like an orca. Right. And and there there take it there's a lot of bites being taken out of it. It was big and it was cool and everybody wanted it, but not everybody could do it as well as that. So other people came along and whether it was podcasts or TV shows or whole networks on uh, on television, um, whole cable channels devoted to it. The, they started nibbling at the paranormal and nibbling at uh at what Art Bell did well. And then there was just less on the bone. You mentioned TV shows. What do you think about those ghost hunters, ghost adventures? They suck. I think a <laughs> lot of them are just terrible. I mean, I like the people that do them, and I love Dave Schrader. I do. But I think a lot of those shows, it's just, it's impossible. Think of, think of it like doing a UFO show. We're going to watch this field, and we got our cameras. And our microphones, oh, look, there's a UFO. It landed right when we got here. You know, I just don't, I don't understand this concept that somehow the ghosts are just, you know, like sitting around smoking cigarettes and sitting on, you know, on chairs like union guys waiting for the, the ghost cameras to show up. And they're like, okay, guys, we're on, you know, and it's like suddenly, <laughs> I just don't believe it. And it's not that I think that, I don't think they're disingenuous. I was just seeing a promo the other day and it was like, Oh, come on. You know, I, I, I mean, I've been on a couple of ghost things and those they're kind of interesting and he's got, it's all very atmospheric, but there's, there's no way that stands on under any kind of scrutiny. Right. Yeah. As their greatest TV shows, but they're not, it's, it's not real research and it's not, I don't know. I don't believe them. Most of the time, I just don't believe them. Having done some of those investigations without big camera crews and stuff, let me tell you, it's more fighting to stay awake than... Uh... <laughs> Hell yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it's like, I, I, I it's, um, I, I think it's, the questions are good, right? I mean, I really enjoyed Dave Schrader's work. And he asks really good questions, 
whether he's interviewing somebody who lives in a haunted house or there's whatever, the concept that you always get an answer on demand. <laughs> I, I'm glad that he doesn't fake it, you know, and the shows that do fake it. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I'll say it for you. <laughs> yeah. I, know, so, I still buy it. So on coast, what's your favorite thing to talk about? I've oh I so I've always had this specialty which I've tripped into, uh, but it is so fit my interest level. Um, I love alternative or crypto. We we were the kind of the first to call it that. Um, science, um, religion, and history. You know, I really enjoy talking about these things that are the, especially like alternative history, understandings of history, um, and people who do. Any type of, uh, I just did a UFO show that I thought was really good. Um, not because of me, but because of the guest. And he, you know what they were doing? They did original research. They were actually, they weren't just doing derivative stuff they were pulling online, you know, and, and turning it into a show. They got off their butts and they went out and they were tracking the stuff down. I, to me, that's where it's at. It's like, what do you, what do you bring that, that's original to the table? Um, because I've, I've heard these stories before. I've seen these things before. Um, I like, um, I really, I, I mean, like we, we did this thing not too long ago on, uh, on Jack the Ripper. And I like it when actually somebody sits down and does some really original work on things that we thought we knew. That's always cool to me. Um, but I, I also do a lot of the pop culture stuff. We kind of do off speed pitch nights where we just kind of, we're not trying to throw fastballs. We're just having fun with being a national radio show. And um, so that's kind of fun too, to hear the stories of, uh, uh, of big stars who are on the road uh, or actors or actresses that have something to say that fall within the kind of with the coasty kind of vibe. Um, very interested in serial killers and that kind, the concept of evil and like sort of exploring evil, evil, and that's kind of what brought me around to doing that. The podcast vaudeville for the frightened was just like the number of shows we've done about trying to find out what makes people evil, what makes good people do evil things, what makes evil people from birth. Is it mm -hmm. something defective, a mentally defective? Is it all biochem? You know, what else is nature versus nurture? That's, I can't get it. I really, this is a personal thing. I, I could have that, that conversation once a week um, because I, I find that so interesting. And that's why I wrote this fictional podcast mm -hmm. based on these interviews that I'd conducted over the years. Yeah, I'm doing a spiritual summer kind of series, and, sure. and that's that's why I brought cool. you on because definitely some of the questions we were talking about Love were that. way spiritual, and then I could work the paranormal Love through, that. you know, because there's you got to kind of you know play to the base a little bit, but stretch. Well, no, no, like no but that's and I, yeah, I think you're hitting on something. That's not so. just that's not a stretch. You're hitting on something. I think there's a people that are open to conversations of the spiritual. Are probably open to a lot of things and why not why not have that conversation with them i i don't believe you know like people keep i can't get my head around bigfoot as an interdimensional spirit being but i know that some native americans believe that it makes sense when they talk about it but then afterwards i'm always in that place where i'm like wait no i don't get it uh or ufos being interdimensional projections of our spirit and i can't i don't know i can't get there but it, I, it, it's interesting to try it's good to stretch i i can kind of get there with bigfoot quicker than i could a, a ufo like i could kind of you know because we you know the traces and just not enough evidence either way but there's been enough sightings to make you think there's something going on oh i mean the if they're having when they have congressional hearings about yeti i'm all for it you know I, I i like facts i'm at my at my core i'm i'm 
I just, I'm still a journalist and I, I give me facts, give me something that you, that we can work with. And as a researcher, you know, I know what I've seen and I know what other people report, but that doesn't make it a fact. But the, the Pentagon and all of these uh, videos, it's, there's, and those are facts. You know, it's a fact that we can look at and that, that whatever that is, is doing something that we don't, we can't replicate. Yeah, that's, that's trippy. When it, that, you know, yeah, when... it is. <laughs> Good word for it. Too. So we've got the, I'm going to cut you, I'm going to cut you out a little bit early because we started late. So, but I got two more questions for you. No, no problem. The easy, easiest two questions of the interview. Where can people find you and your, your books and your podcast? You know, give me that hard yeah. sell right now. Go for it. Uh, uh, no, you're, 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 not I, you're not a hard sell. You're not a hard sell. That's where I always like, read it, read it. Don't, don't. Um, my publishers love that. Um, so um, Amazon has uh so i I've, I've written some uh and or edited academic books so uh like i really love one of my favorite books is one i co-edited and i wrote about 30 percent of uh which is a book on um the history of uh, uh car audio loved that Ooh. that was so much fun but it was really, really interesting. So I really like that book. Um, it's a it's a cultural history of how uh, audio ended up in cars and how those two things interplay. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, Amazon for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, my favorite true crime book um, is a uh, Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell. I wrote a book on understanding true crime called Toward a Theory of True Crime. Uh, that's pretty um, pointy headed, but it's really interesting, um, I think. And then um, uh, books on journalism, but those are all on Amazon, as far as I know. And then uh, the podcast is on the iHeart platform, and that is a vaudeville for the frightened. We've done our first series of uh, stories. It's in seven or eight installments, um, and it's called uh, Bottom of the Box. Um, and it's a little mystery that you can try to solve as you go along. Uh, and, um, and then coast to coast AM, which runs on. Wherever you can days. find it. <laughs> yeah. Where I, it's in, in bad dental work. Well, you know, yeah. it's available all sorts of places where, <laughs> uh, that picks up radio signals. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned you know, your love affair with audio and cars. So I've got to ask you, yep. are you an AM radio purist or? Not purist, no, but an AM serves an important function. We're not done with it yet. I understand why other countries have eliminated it um, and they seem to be getting by just fine, but I don't think we're there yet. Our country's too big. Um, and uh, I think it'll be a while before we can take AM out of cars. Um yeah, because I was on LinkedIn the other day. You're going to love this. And this guy bought a new Ford pickup truck or car or something. And on his digital jet dash, there wasn't an AM. And he took it back. Yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, I think Ford made a promise and a lot of the have too that they're not going to abandon AM. AM should be there. I mean, you can still listen to AM on a mobile device, right? And the same device that people are listening to us right now or seeing us right now, you can still get AM signals. So, you know, there's a time when we'll transition away. Um, the FCC was never able to figure out the uh, AM signal problem in urban areas, uh, but in uh, suburban or rural areas, um, it plays a, yeah. an important role, and uh, and 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 in areas where people can't afford access to other uh, types of uh, um, you know um, audio delivery systems, AM plays a life saving role, especially at night. So no, I don't think we're ready to 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 dump it yet. And okay. So I, I promise. I hope he wasn't in love with that truck because I mean I I love a good truck, but it's gotta have AM. It's gotta have AM radio in it. So for the the most difficult question of this interview, drum roll please. Yeah. What's right. your go to What's your go to breakfast? 
Oh, you know, I'm a vegetarian now. So um, my go-to, I still look at the commercials for uh, like a, a IHOP or a Denny's Grand Slam or whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, two strips of bacon, two eggs, two pancakes. That's pretty good. Um, and I will occasionally indulge in some bacon when it, it's screaming, eat me, eat me. But um, other than that, I don't eat any meat. So now it's changed. So my my go to breakfast is either a really good smoothie like I made this morning, uh, which with uh, with uh, frozen fruit and protein powder and some other things I used to get by, but it's helped me lose a lot of weight and, and control my uh, cholesterol a little better. Um, and then, uh, but I still, you know, I'm an old fashioned guy. I'm a farmer's breakfast guy, so I would just, you know, occasionally I'll go out and just have to have. Two eggs over easy, uh, some toast, a uh, good cup of coffee, uh, uh, but just I, I won't do the sausage or anything like that. I'll find somebody else at my table that would like it. So. <laughs> well, Ian, I appreciate you carving out the time this afternoon. And no, sorry, it's about, fine. sorry about the. No. Yeah. So I, I hope appreciate you do. You want to? I'm grateful for the attention. Thank you. I. And thank you for promoting Vaudeville for the Frightened and for all of those books. And I hope I gave a, a good, you know, there's a lot of interesting work in the Bible. People should never give up on the Bible. It's a, it's always there for us. And, you know, how to how how millennials can help us get out of the mess we're in about the Mosaic story. Uh, also a really good book for people who I think are trying to understand spirituality in a modern context. All right. Well, we'll have to do it again sometime. We'll get some more yeah. good questions from my listeners because yeah. I only texted a few of them because I was like, oh, I, you know, I like having their feedback and they knocked my socks off. So I'm sure they'll come yeah. back with some more. So, I'm surprised anytime anybody knows me. I swear to God. I'm like, <laughs> I, I run into it all the time, which is really nice. But I'm like, really? That's okay, cool. So, well, you know, I run in that paranormal spiritual circle. So that are familiar with Coast to Coast. So. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you for including me. Oh, you're welcome. Have a good afternoon. You too. And there we go. So that was Ian Pundit. So I wanted to take a couple minutes here and thank him again uh, for the immense uh, love that he showed and uh, answering uh, some questions from listeners. And I did ask some of them. I didn't get to ask, ask everybody because this kind of came together Sunday afternoon. So... But yeah, we will definitely uh, have him back because he he's definitely looking forward to it, and we'll do that. But I wanted to take a minute and pause, and you'll notice the little different background. I had to use a different computer today. For those of you who are concerned, and yes, that wall's pink. Um, if I I was a little dark early, and I kind of tried to clean it up. Lighting is different during the afternoon and the night so there's all that but the next time we speak i have i'll be back from cleveland and talking with the folks at evergreen podcast and seeing what the future might hold for the mountain record so stay tuned for that until next week